I'm John Flynn, a former prisoner of war in North Vietnam. We returnees would like to communicate to you a portion of our version of the Battle of Hanoi. It is perhaps the most important portion, but is in no way a complete recount of our experiences. Before we start, I would like to emphasize that although this is an Air Force production, our experiences in North Vietnam were totally shared by members of all of our sister services. Our prison population was roughly two-thirds Air Force, one-third Navy, and a relatively small number of Marines, Army, and civilians. But the point I wish to make is that from the very beginning of organized resistance, our efforts were truly joint, and our command and staff were without service identification. In general, the North Vietnamese tried to, first, obtain military information from us, and second, to exploit us politically. And third, they tried to maintain a punishing environment throughout our entire experience. To do these things, they used, first, fear, resulting from torture, which was their chief tactic, and maltreatment. Secondly, they maintained constant pressures and punishments in hopes of forcing their beliefs upon us. And thirdly, they attempted to convince us that we were indeed criminals whose ultimate freedom depended upon each of our individual actions. To combat our captor, we had first our individual integrity and individual conscience. Secondly, we have that beautiful document, the Code of Conduct. And finally, we had communications, communications which were essential to control of the organization that we used in order to unite in our effort to defeat the North Vietnamese. Communications were indeed our lifeblood. We are convinced that without constant efforts to communicate and organize, many of which you will see in this film, all of us would have been more seriously affected by our captivity, and some of us might not have returned with honor, or perhaps not have returned at all. Some of us had been in North Vietnam since the middle of 1964, spending over eight and one half years in POW camps. We were mostly military flyers, but there were foot soldiers, foreign service officers, civilian engineers, and even a West German nurse among our number. Looking back now to those days in the mid-60s when so many of us had entered Hanoi's prisons, I think we all had one thing in common whether we flew from a carrier in the Gulf of Tonkin or an airbase in South Vietnam or Thailand. None of us ever expected to be captured. Somehow you figure that it only happens to the other guy. When it first hits you fully that you're a prisoner, it's like nothing that you've ever experienced before. You feel alone and helpless. First, you feel guilty because you let yourself get captured. Second, you correctly anticipate that you're shortly going to catch a lot of hell. And you don't really know how you're going to handle that. Third, and above all else, you know you're scared. Damn scared. Remember your situation, you would be very wise to cooperate with us. 
My arm hurts. Please, get me to a doctor. For the last time, what was your mission? My name is Charles Robert Stevenson. 18940. Answer One... the question. What was your mission? I can't answer that. We're taught to give on taught. the name. It does not matter what you were taught. When I'm repatriated, I'll be held accountable. Repatriated? You certainly are an optimist, Stevenson. You will be returned only when and if it pleases us. The war will end someday. had better understand me. No one but us knows that you are here. There is no advantage to us to reveal that we hold you. It remains to be seen if you are of any value to us. You had better try to establish that you can be useful to us. It's only common human decency to let my country know that I'm a prisoner. Listen to me. Making war on my country by the United States is a crime against humanity. You are causing great hardship and destruction in Vietnam. You who have bombed us are nothing more than common criminals. The food you eat, the medical care that we humanely give you, take from our ability to meet the needs of our people. We have no more obligation to you. If I were you, I would not waste my time thinking about returning to your country. If you want to remain alive, I would advise you to prove to us that you are worthy of our lenient and humane treatment. I'm Colonel Ray Merritt, the narrator you've been hearing. I was a prisoner of war in North Vietnam for nearly seven and a half years. We don't always realize how much we need and want the company of friendly human beings. But when we're deprived of that association, we're likely to become despondent because isolation is one of the worst punishments that can be inflicted on a person. Our need to communicate with others on a regular basis is so great that the inability to communicate can mean the difference between normalcy and insanity. I can assure you that the North Vietnamese understood the importance of denying communication while applying pressure to American PWs. This new PW feels desperately alone. Perhaps for the first time he realizes how much being able to communicate means to him. This need to communicate will not diminish with time. He will slowly adjust to his circumstances. A small cell, barred windows, hostile guards, a bland diet, and the like. But his need to communicate while a captive will always be real and pressing. From the earliest days of captivity in North Vietnam, the V, as we call the North Vietnamese, decided that their purposes were best served by forbidding communication. So they isolated prisoners to enforce this policy, punishing those who dared to violate it. What is it? Who are you? What? Who are you? Stevenson, Bob Stevenson. What? Say again. Bob Stevenson. Triple nickel. No talk. No talk. But there were equally important reasons other than emotional and psychological for PWs to communicate. Although it was in violation of the 1949 Geneva Convention, the North Vietnamese refused to acknowledge the capture of many PWs. This created a great deal of mental anguish for the families of American men fighting in Southeast Asia. 
It therefore became important for PWs in North Vietnam to know who was held captive. It was this need that motivated many prisoners of the V to memorize the names of more than 500 PWs. There were other cogent reasons for PWs in Vietnam to communicate. Articles 3 and 4 of the Code of Conduct for American Servicemen enjoined PWs to resist by all means available and to establish and adhere to a military organization. For the most part, this was done successfully in North Vietnam. PW organizational efforts eventually culminated in the 4th Allied POW Wing, which was formed in early 1971, with Air Force Colonel John Peter Flynn as its commander. The V knew that to stymie the effectiveness of any PW organization, they would have to prevent communication between the prisoners. They did not succeed. The ingenuity, imagination, and perseverance of the PWs in creating communication network helped to achieve the objective stated in the motto of the 4th Allied POW Wing, Return with Honor. There are five general reasons why prisoners need to communicate in PW camps. Number one is to let others know that you are a captive. Number two is to make known your physical condition. Number three is to learn and spread the identity of other prisoners. Number four is to receive and pass on the policies and orders of the senior ranking officer. Number five is to let everyone know the thrust of ongoing interrogations, or as we call them, quizzes, so that all can be prepared when their turn comes. I've been using the word communication a lot. It's one of those words that can have different meanings. For our purposes, it means simply to impart information in any way that can be understood by others. The problem for us PWs in North Vietnam, of course, was not being able to communicate openly. Communication there had to be by covert means. Captivity in future conflicts may be somewhat different from the Vietnam War. Nonetheless, captors have always wanted to minimize communication between their prisoners. We may expect that future captors will likewise attempt to prohibit communication. In North Vietnam, we learned our greatest help in resisting efforts to exploit us came from the strength that we gave each other. To a tremendous extent, that strength derived from being able to communicate with each other. But PW communication in North Vietnam had to be covert. This film, therefore, is about covert as opposed to open communication by American servicemen in captivity. Covert communication by American PWs in Vietnam began at Wallo Prison in Hanoi. You may also have heard it called the Hanoi Hilton. Virtually all of us spent some time in this camp, an old French prison in the heart of downtown Hanoi. It was during the early days of the Vietnam War that the first PWs foresaw the need to develop covert communications technique. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Smitty Harris told his cellmates and while in survival school, he had learned a system of covert communication. This system was the TAP code, an ingeniously simple method that became the mainstay of PW communications in North Vietnam. Colonel Harris insisted that his fellow PWs learn the system. In mid-1965, when the V separated the Americans and began a maximum effort to isolate them as much as possible, the PWs were forced to rely almost totally on covert communications. We shall now see how some of this communication was carried out. As you would expect, film footage of the application of covert communication practices in North Vietnamese prison camps doesn't exist. Nonetheless, the situations dramatized here are realistic representations of what actually took place. This new PW, similar to many of you, has never received instruction in covert communication.
Our PW is now aware of the existence of the tap code and has received written instructions on its use. Over the years, we developed many variations of the basic tap code. Here to assist me in explaining the tap code and some of these variations is Colonel Bob Sawhill, who spent over five and a half years in North Vietnam. As you'll recall, Colonel Merritt said that the tap code was extremely simple. The letters of the alphabet are simply arranged in a 5x5 five five matrix as shown here. Because there are only 25 squares, the letter K is omitted and a C is substituted for any K which may appear in a message. Any letter within the matrix can be uniquely located by specifying first a row value and then a column value. The letter O would have a value of 3, 4. That is, row 3, column 4. And H would have a value of 2, 3, row 2, column 3. These coordinates are then transmitted via any of a number of ways, the most common of which is wall tapping. To transmit an H, for example, the PW taps twice for row 2, pauses, and then taps three times for column 3. The word resist would be tapped like this. With more proficiency, it would sound like this. Note that the pause between letters is a bit longer than that between rows and columns. When a word was completed, the sender would wait for an acknowledgement from the receiver. The tap code is not something that most people would learn without having the need for that knowledge. You may be sure that the captivity situation provides plenty of motivation. Prisoners have been known to learn the tap code in a few minutes. Many PWs taught the code to others by tapping without any face-to-face -face or vocal contact. In one case, the guy being taught finally figured out by trial and error what the tapping meant. Many PWs, however, were first taught to communicate by using a more basic code, which we call the ABC tap code. It's as simple as it sounds. You just tap once for A, twice for B, three times for C, and so on through 26 taps for Z. It's laborious, but it works. Occasionally, the V would try to trap PWs by tapping to them from empty cells. There was one sure way, of, however, of calling a guy so that he could be sure it wasn't the V trying to trick him. You just tap the old familiar, he would answer with, and you'd be in business. The V never caught on to this recognition signal. Who are you? The guy in the next cell wants to know who in the hell I am.
We had to take care in using the tap code. We found that continually placing your ear to the same spot on the wall would soon leave marks from body oils and perspiration. Also, tapping on the same spot would eventually cause plaster or whitewash to crack or discolor. In some camps, the Vietnamese listened carefully for tapping and even inspected our hands for evidence, such as red knuckles or whitewash under our fingernails. So sometimes tapping was not only inadvisable, but practically impossible. But the V couldn't stop us from applying good old Yankee ingenuity. The most important element in successful communication is not the system itself, but the will to communicate. Still, the tap code is one of the best known methods of covert communication because it can be disguised in various ways. Here's an example. One method of harassment which the North Vietnamese used on us was the familiar work detail. And so, despite the V, this PW uses the tap code. He is broadcasting the word that a new group of prisoners have arrived at the camp. Two PWs managed to obtain musical instruments in camp. They figured out how to communicate while playing using the tap code. He is sending an order from the senior ranking officer in his group. The communication might be a directive relating to the code of conduct. We called such policy statements plums. They were invaluable in maintaining the unity, military discipline, and spirit that gave us the will to survive captivity in the best possible physical and mental health. Same type of caper. The V must have laughed over how lousy these guys played. The beauty of the tap code is that you can use it in so many different ways. <coughs> to the North Vietnamese, such noises as coughs, hacking, and spitting could seem natural. <coughs> Navy Captain Jerry Denton invented a comm system in 1969 which used these same sounds to represent the rows and columns of the tap code matrix. One sniff or one cough <coughs> became row one or column one, while two sniffs or coughs became row two or column two. Row three was transmitted by clearing your throat. <clears throat> row four by a hacking sound. <sniffs> and row five by a sneeze or spit. <sniffs> so the letter H would be sent by two coughs for row two, followed by a clearing of the throat for column three. <coughs> <clears throat> a whole message could sound like a TB ward. There were lots of other ways to transmit the rows and columns of the tap code. After more than a year's struggle, party leadership and scientific work have been greatly strengthened. It has now been proved that under party leadership and with politics in command, the scientific enterprises of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam can develop at an unprecedentedly high speed. It is obvious now that the party is a genuine expert, not only in establishing the direction, principles, and policies for scientific work, but also in leading scientific operations forward in a much better way than imperialist experts. Experiences in the development of science in Vietnam during the past few years have proved that only by starting from the standpoint of production and socialist construction 
can the scientific institutions of the country develop rapidly? A sliver of glass is used here. Other methods that have worked included using the bottom of a plate, a kerosene lantern, or any object which would reflect light. Tapping the Morse code was also attempted, but it proved nearly impossible to discriminate between the dots and dashes. Even casting shadows could be used to communicate by the tap code matrix. The sweep of a broom instead of a tapping sound? That's how many prisoners used the tap code to communicate. Colonel Hervey S. Stockman is the senior ranking officer here. Still the same gimmick, only the number of knots in the string correspond to the number of taps to form a letter in the tap code. You can see that to use some variations of the tap code took considerable time. But remember, all we had was time, plenty of time. In this application of the tap code matrix, a normal overhand throwing motion meant row one. Three quarters overhand, row two. Sidearm, row three. Three quarters underhand, row four. And underhand, row five. But that wasn't the only way physical motion could be used. Can it be that this guy is using exercises in the tap code pattern? to communicate? You bet he is. Notwithstanding the tremendous value of non-written communication, writing was not neglected. Quite the opposite. Note drops were sometimes the first means of communication that a prisoner had with other PWs. Of course, not all PWs knew the tap code when captured. And one of the key means of transmitting instructions about the tap code was by writing. But you can easily understand that writing is more risky than non-written communication. If caught, that piece of paper provides hard evidence that's pretty tough to deny. We learn to look for notes in the bathing areas mainly because several buildings used the same one. Also, holes or cracks in outside walls provided places for note drops. As you'd expect, there were some messages that we didn't want the V2 to understand, if perchance they intercepted the note. So once again, through the combined efforts of some very creative guys, three systems were developed in order to scramble or disguise messages so that they could not be read by the V. One of these was the tic-tac-toe method. A second was one we called the slip and slide, while the last was known as the clock code. Let's look at each of them in that sequence. In using the tic-tac-toe code, the letters of the alphabet are arranged in the two matrices shown here. To encode a message, each letter is simply represented by its portion of the matrix with the letters removed. So an A would be represented by this symbol. The second letter in each grouping, for example the B, is represented by the same symbol as the first, but with the dot inserted. Using this same system, the letter C is this symbol. And the second letter of the pair, D, is the same symbol with the dot inserted. Likewise, 
These are the symbols for an S and a T. The word resist, for example, would look like this. I think we got the V pretty frustrated at times. The second system for encrypting messages was known as the slip and slide for reasons I think you'll soon see. Let's assume we want to send this message warning others of an impending interrogation for biographic data. First, we slip the message by either increasing or decreasing the value of each letter. Assume that it's Monday when the slip value is plus one. That means we add one to the value of each letter, or in effect, we use the following letter of the alphabet. So the T becomes a U, the O becomes a P, the U becomes a V, and so forth until the entire message is transformed to look like this. If it's Tuesday, we add two to each letter in our original message so that the T now becomes a V, the O becomes a Q, and so forth, again yielding a scrambled message. On Wednesday, we add three to each letter, and on the other days of the week, we subtract letters rather than adding. Once the message has been slipped to look like this, for example, we then further scramble it by sliding it. That is, we take the last three letters and move them to the front, then the next three, and so forth, until the entire message is reversed in this manner. It's now ready for transmission. The third coding system was known as the note tap code or the clock code. It results in a series of symbols as shown here, each of which specifies a particular location in the tap code matrix. The code is based on the hands of a clock which has been turned on its side. The upper hand specifies the row value, here row two, while the lower hand is the column value. The symbol shown here represents an H, row two, column three in the tab code. This is an O, row three, column four, while this is an N, row three, column three. Another O, followed by an R, row four, column two. And we have the word honor encrypted. Notes were concealed in any number of ways. We had to analyze the situation and take advantage of whatever communication opportunities were available. In the Hanoi Hilton, as only one example, we used many techniques to pass messages. Some were pretty clever. A German nurse named Monika Schwinn was interned by the V at Camp Huey. The V let her keep a kitten. Each day, the kitten would go from cell to cell begging food. Miss Schwinn had made a collar for the kitten and would hide notes in it. At the Sante PW camp, Prisoners were permitted to put nails in the walls. The PW soon figured how to use this opportunity to pass notes.
good old honey bucket was also used to send notes. You could place notes under the lid of the bucket and under the metal band around the bucket. The bee weren't awfully keen to examine that particular item in search of communications. You may be wondering what we had to write with. The answer is a variety of things, but not much of it. We used any and everything we could lay our hands on that would mark. Pencils, pens, brick dust, rice ink, cigarette ashes, charcoal on the end of a stick or nail, or the point of a toothpaste tube that the V issued. Places where notes could be left and then picked up later by other PWs were called mailboxes or drops. We used the clothesline as a drop. You could take someone else's clothing and leave yours with a note in it. Later, you could explain to the guard that you took the clothing by mistake and then hope to make an exchange. Whatever techniques we devised, we had to be constantly alert and careful. You cannot deny this. We have warned you that communicating with other criminals is against the lenient and humane rules of this camp. The V, fortunately, were not as sharp as some other captors might be. Nevertheless, silent covert communication had to be used much more than any other means. But the tap code was not the only technique found to work. We learned to communicate by hand signals using a system called the hand code. This code probably began with the simple flashing of fingers to transmit the rows and columns of the tap code. For example, row two, column three. Later this was refined to a variation of the method which mutes are taught in schools throughout the world. Credit for the introduction of this system appears to belong to Air Force Major Red Bird, who probably learned its basics from his deaf sister back in the States. The use of both hands to form letters of the alphabet was tried in North Vietnam. Here, a PW teaches the code to his cellmates. Q, R, S, D, U, B, W, X. a lot faster with one hand. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Some of our best communicators developed amazing speed, as shown here in this demonstration by Captain Ed Meckenbeyer. The hand code could be used in many different environments, where there was the will to communicate there always appeared to be some way. At the camp known as Dog Patch, the V placed us in selected buildings so that the line of sight from one to another was blocked. We solved this problem by using certain buildings as relay stations. For example, this building housed the senior ranking officer. To send a message to this building, the routing would go first to this building, then to this building, then to the adjacent building, across the road to here, and then to its final destination. From a distance, it was easier to see two hands working the hand code. It could be quite an operation. Some of the guys served as clearers or lookouts to warn of any approaching V. We even learned to detect the coming of the V by their shadows or footsteps. It wasn't always easy to communicate in the camps, and communication was often tedious. But we felt it was well worth the effort. For example, we were able to develop resistance guidelines, which when transmitted to all PWs, allowed us to establish a common, unified line of resistance. from wing is that we don't make 
propaganda statements, except under torture. Minimize the net gain to the V. Sign it. Then we will see that your arm is treated immediately. You know I can't do that. You are trying our patience, criminal. I've given you all the information required of me under Article 17 of the Geneva Agreements. That's a statement against my country. I can't sign it. The Geneva Agreement does not apply to criminals. I'm a military man, a prisoner of war. We shall see what you are. As I hope we've made clear, communicating in the North Vietnamese PW camps wasn't easy. But surprisingly enough, a method of verbal communication was discovered by some anonymous but creative guys. Your room they found that they could quiz. communicate through the walls of their adjoining cells by using the cups as megaphones and receivers, like the tin can and string Remember, you used as a kid. When they question you, sit up straight and don't cross your legs. Got it. Tell the guys to keep a Again, cool head. Again, care had to be taken to prevent again. telltale marks on the walls from we'll constant do. use. We also we found it wise to muffle our voices as much as possible. Trying to break Wrapping a towel or blanket around the cup worked pretty well Not for this purpose. Some it. were caught and paid a painful Good. price Good. for their dedication. Here In the end, this system, as were all others, was developed because we so desperately needed to communicate. For example, a PW might not know the major differences between the customs and culture of the United States and the captors. In North Vietnam, there were many instances where this lack of knowledge caused PWs some pain. Communication between the older experienced PWs and the more recent captives might have prevented some of these problems. Not be put in such an expensive aircraft. And don't cross your legs. Some PWs learned the hard way that crossing your legs was an insult. Today, we've attempted to do a number of things. First, I hope we've shown the importance and necessity of communication between PWs in captivity. Second, I hope that we've demonstrated clearly how some particular communication systems were successfully used in North Vietnam. Third, I hope that we've established that with the proper dedication and determination to do the job, American prisoners can find a way to do it. That may be the most significant implication of the experiences gained from our captivity in Southeast Asia. Very likely, we've only scratched the surface in finding all the possible ways to achieve covert communication. Finally, I want to say that what American prisoners in North Vietnam accomplished is a matter of record. I'm confident that most of us who were PWs there believe in the motto of our fourth allied POW wing, return with honor. We also believe that to a tremendous extent, the maintenance of communication helped us to obtain the goals implicit in that motto.